Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and very often Auto House of Naples, but not today because I am back in Penelope's shop. And uh, I'm back here because we've got some projects going. Uh, I work with Penelope fairly extensively. Uh, it's a bit of a side thing that we've had cooking for a while, and it's all great fun. And uh, today I have... Well, I have a video that's basically getting aborted, but I'm doing it anyway. Uh, it, it's ostensibly, it's a 1980 Toyota Corolla wagon, and we'll get into that. Uh, but it's morphed into something else as I started sort of researching the car last night and thinking about it and going over it. I realized that the friggin' thing is an appliance. I mean, it's a toaster. Uh, it's, it's, there's just not much you can honestly say about a 1980 Toyota Corolla. And it really surprised me because I had been looking forward to the video. Uh, you know, I went into it, I thought, okay, I'm gonna do the history of Toyota, you know, all the comfort women and the World War II stuff. But I've done that before. You know, they started as a loom company and uh, one of the Toyota kids decided to make cars and ah, blah, blah, blah. I'll link to that video if I can find it where I went over all that. So that quickly bored me to tears. So then I thought, okay, let's just get into the history of the Corolla, and within seven minutes, I was basically asleep in my chair with the iPad falling off uh, between my legs down onto the ground. So that absolutely sucked. And uh, and I just said then I started watching some movie, some Russian movie about a tank or something, and it was pretty good. So I did that. And then I tried to go back to the research, but eh, it just didn't work out uh, because here I am looking through the viewfinder at a brown. Yeah, surprise, surprise, 1980 Toyota Corolla wagon. Uh, so look, here's what we're going to do, and here's what the video has morphed into, uh, because I'm over again at Penelope's shop. And you remember, we've talked about Penelope before. Uh, she is the one who made it big with, uh, uh, you know, vaginal uh, sprays for hygiene and enhancement and rubber ball gags and uh, edible panties and other assorted sundries. Uh, you know, this, this has worked well for her and she's created a little bit of an empire. She likes cars, so she decided to make a shop where she works on them. And uh, rather than work on them, she just keeps collecting them. And I've been instrumental in that because I go around to these places, I see these cars, I and oh my God, Penelope, you gotta get this thing. This thing's gonna be a great fun project, so on and so forth. So she ends up buying them and then they just kind of sit here. Uh, so this video may have morphed into a collection of cars that I've bought while being extremely drunk. And this is not something that I'm proud of, okay? I mean, this is... I mean, I had to think about this a little bit because, I mean, I don't necessarily want to be the guy out there who's, oh, that Bill, he goes around buying cars drunk. But God damn it, sometimes that's just the way that it works out. And uh, and it did in a few cases, such as this one and uh, some of the cars around me. So uh, anyway, look, here, here's the thing. I'm going to go over the cars. I, I, Daddy, you know what? I, I mean, I don't have any notes. This is just winging it. So uh, here you see the Toyota. Uh, this Toyota, this Land Cruiser, this FJ, uh, Penelope found herself and sent me over, you know, like some sort of a uh, slave errand boy to go get it in the East Coast, which sucked. But I did, and uh, now they're working on that one. So I guess that's going to become something. Uh, that Triumph over there, I was not drunk, but I was drinking uh, when I bought it. And that turned out to be a very, very nice car. Uh, under that is a Porsche. Under this is that uh, Peugeot that we did. Um, this little Speedster came from a really honestly, genuinely fucked up store in Georgia. A little used car store with some kind of lunatic. Uh, running it. We ended up getting it and you know, there it is. This Corvette, okay, this is a 1968 four-speed Corvette. I am not gonna lie, when I say I bought this car, I was knee-walking drunk. I mean, I, 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 could, I had to close one eye to only see one and a half Corvettes. And that was not my fault. That's the fault of Peter, uh, of course, who we've talked about before, the Austrian, uh, the guy who used to own Auto House. Uh, before he sold me like a piece of furniture to, to other people. Uh, but uh, I'm at this metal auction in Punta Gorda. This thing's coming through really, really late. 
and uh, and I see it, and I think, wow, yeah, that's a good look. That's 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 a nice old Coke. That's third jet. That's a nice Corvette, and I see what it goes for, and it's going cheap. And I think, oh my God, I need to buy this thing. But I realized after I won it, and I mean, it was a miracle I could even bid at all. This is, Peter had been plying me with whiskey for like three hours. I've gone to the bar with Peter in my, we don't go out that often, but we've gone out probably five times over the course of 10 or 12, 15 years. And every one of those five times, I have ended up knee walking drunk. I mean, uh, the guy just keeps throwing them at you and throwing them at you. And before you know it, uh, you are completely incoherent. And I was when I bought this. And it is an absolute miracle that it turned out to be a pretty good buy. We had a Corvette guy look at it. He, you know, knew what we paid for it. He looked the car over. He said, yeah, yeah, no, no, man, you guys did great. That, uh, that's a good one. Man, I can't tell you what a sigh of relief that was because, I mean, the thing could have been made up of five different Corvettes all patched together with Elmer's glue, and I wouldn't have known the difference, I think, at that stage. So uh, I guess the good news in all of this is that I can somewhat trunk, uh, trust my drunk self to buy something, and uh, that also bodes well for the continuing use of the uh, coronavirus whiskey. So. Anyway, there it is. One last car. I can't say I was shit can drunk when I bought this, but I wasn't exactly sober either. And that is this 1964 Buick Wildcat. Uh, I traveled to Tampa to get this thing. It was at a weird auction that didn't make any sense. Like, uh, the lot before this car was a bag of hammers, and the lot after this car was a welder missing its cover, and they weren't sure if it worked. And by the way, despite that, as is the case with, you know, modern everything. The car went for a significant amount of money, which just really annoyed the shit out of me. I thought we were going to get a bargain. Uh, but I love it. I love this thing. We're going to do an actual proper video on this after it gets ready. Uh, it's a 64 Wildcat. It's got a 401 V8. Uh, it came from a guy who died. Uh, in fact, he passed away in Dubai, of all places. So I don't know if he was an Arab. He was American. Uh, and uh, it's just friggin awesome. It's a California black plate car. Uh, very, very cool to look at. It's got that early muscle car look that I kind of enjoy, like the original GTOs. I just think it looks really, really cool. And uh, man, are we happy to have it. So after we get it all ready, whatever little bits and pieces it needs, I'll do a nice video on that. And uh, this one's probably going to go to the auction. But I mean, even having a look inside, the bucket seats, the center console, it's got a tack in the uh, center console. Uh, the power top works, the power windows work, it's got tilt. Um, it's just a sweet old car and frankly, uh, I don't often get emotionally attached to these things, but with this car I have a little bit. And uh, if I had any room at all, I'd lobby to own it. Uh, yesterday, actually while sober, I bought a limousine, so I'm not sure if we're gonna do a video on that or not, uh, but uh, maybe, uh, why not? Uh, town car limousine, actually it's a Cadillac Brome, <coughs> and God knows those things haven't, um, you know, they haven't really been around for, I mean, any new limo is an SUV. The limo is basically a thing of the past. Uh, let's walk into the sun for a minute. I'm give you a little tour around here for a second. We'll see what else we got going. There's all kinds of shit that lingers around this place. It's one of our friends named Dave. He brought over a pile of junk on a trailer that no reason nobody can understand. Uh, this is Penelope's race car trailer. Uh, I actually went with her to, uh, we picked it up somewhere in North Georgia at some place that custom made it. And it's, you know, it's it's way too long for a bumper tow. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if she didn't get a bumper tow, then she'd have had to give up her ladder rack and couldn't have had a fifth wheel. So, you know, there you go. Uh, but it holds two cars, and uh, she's raced spec Miatas with us at least, you know, two or three out of the 50 or 70 times we've gone. And uh, so otherwise, it just sits there. Uh, and this is uh, some kind of old turbo Miata that's been sitting in some kind of old Suburban behind it that's a future project. Uh, this is a Prius, and it's got a W30 <laughs> license plate on it. Now, if you watch my videos, you may have heard me talk about a guy named Uncle Johnny. And if uh, if you have, 
then the W30 plate on that Prius might actually make sense to you. So, oh God, he's an interesting cat. He came over today in his bathrobe and uh, coffee cup to uh, uh, have a cigarette and see what the hell was going on. Uh, we'll have a quick walk to the back before we get back into the Toyota, which is ostensibly the review that this is going to be. All right, the boat, I don't know what the hell that is. It's not very exciting at all, but there it is. Uh, there's that Datsun tow truck, which um, I can't remember if they called it the Stinger or something. I bought that at that same fucked up dealership in Georgia uh, where uh, it had been. So apparently, he bought a bunch of crap from a place called Billy Papel. Datsun that uh, after they went out of business and uh, I'm lobbying for restoration on that thing because I think it's friggin awesome and uh, I just absolutely love it. Uh, there's one of these old Toyota Roadsters, uh, sorry Datsun Roadsters, like 1200, 1500, whatever the hell it is. Um, this is one that Penelope regrets buying. I guess it looked a lot better in the uh, pictures than it did in person. <laughs> it's a Mini Cooper that's probably better left not talked about. And uh, back here, there's some sort of MGB and another couple of dots and pickups. So there's just shit all over the place. There's the drive on lift for wheel alignments. I mean, this woman has really set up a pretty incredible shop for herself. It'd be uh, fascinating to see if she ever starts actually using it for anything. <clears throat> there it is with the Wildcat logo. And you see the California. God, I like this car. This car I like. That's just a neat piece. But anyway, okay, real quick, let's get this out of the way and over with. This is going to be a short video, unedited. It's just going to be what it is. This is a 1980 Toyota Corolla station wagon. And I'll tell you what, the first Toyota Corolla wagon I had, my dad bought a new one in 1976 uh, when we first moved down to Naples. I think we moved in 76. He went back up to Chicago because he knew some dealer up there. Bought the 76 Corolla, which is not this body style, by the way. That was the third gen. This is the fourth gen. Uh, the one he bought was a little rounder, but it was the same shit color brown with woody panels down the side. And uh, it just became one of the epic cars of our times. I mean, they put, uh, my dad and mom, they put like 150,000 miles on it. Then they sold it to my giant asshole friend. His name is Life. They sold it to his brother. Uh, and Life at one stage, had, had, he was carrying the uh, rear end from uh, my sister's 81 Datsun in the back. And I guess as he was driving like a nitwit, uh, the thing tipped over. Out of the vent came all the gear oil, which essentially just totaled the car. I mean, it was, it smelled so bad of gear oil inside, nobody could own it. But his brother did. They put in a bunch of those little hanging trees from the mirrors and they drove it for like another 200,000 miles. So uh, that car was around in my youth. Uh, I remember also as a completely idiot kid buying like an 81 Tercel for 200 bucks. And I mean, look, these are the days of your youth when you really are a, a jerk, a retard, a horrible person. And I took this nice little car that some nice old guy drove, but he wanted to cut a kid a break. And he sold it to me for like 200 bucks. It needed front brakes or something. And, and me and my idiot friends, we took this thing and brought it back into the industrial park where we had a shop. We'd get it up to like 60 or 70 miles an hour, yank the e-brake and do like eight donut spinning until we almost hit the culvert at the end of the road. There's also a ramp we jumped it off of. And we just beat the living crap out of that poor little Toyota. Uh, but it took it. <laughs> it absolutely took it. And I ended up selling it to a friend of mine for like 500 bucks who then had to put brakes on it. Uh, he said uh, the, uh, the shop that put the brakes on it had never seen anything so fucked up in their lives, but, uh, but he did. And then he drove it for like 100,000 miles. And I guess that is the whole point of these cars. You know, even while I'm sitting here being incredibly bored, I'm looking through the viewfinder at this intensely, intensely boring 1980 Toyota, uh, I cannot but help notice that it's still here, it's still going strong, and it still exists, and all over the world they still exist, and they're valued and they're cherished, not in spite of being appliances, but because they're appliances, because they're reasonably comfortable cars that run without 
any true issues. They require very little maintenance and go for hundreds of thousands of miles. So. Uh, it's just one of those things. Uh, this one being an 80 US model still has the four round lamps in front, which I think look nice. Uh, I believe in 81, uh, those became square head lamps, which um, yeah, it didn't look as cool to me. Uh, it was also the last rear wheel drive Corolla where every one of them, every different variety of Corolla, and there were a few, there were uh, hard tops and fastbacks and liftbacks and, you know, vans and sedans and coupes, uh, you know, they were all rear wheel drive. And I guess that makes them uh, a little bit, you know, popular with the tuners now. Um, again, it's the fourth gen. The first Toyota Corolla came out in 1966 and it was a big move for Toyota. You know, they weren't sure how it was going to do and it did pretty well. The second generation took off. It absolutely took off. Uh, people started buying it up in droves and it became a very, very good selling car. Uh, enter the third generation, which is the one that I had uh, some experience with, and that went off like gangbusters and started selling. So, I mean, long story short, here, here's what's fascinating about the Toyota Corolla. It became the best-selling car worldwide by 1974 uh, during the second gen. And uh, by 1997, it would become the best-selling nameplate of all time, surpassing the Volkswagen Beetle. So, um, you know, yeah, it's an appliance, it's a toaster, uh, but it became an absolute institution for Toyota, and uh, so much so that it's still going today. And that means something. You can't go buy a new Toyota Cressida or Crown or Corona, uh, but you can go buy a new Toyota Corolla. It's a name that they're just not going to give up uh, because, again, the best-selling car in the entire world. Uh, this, again, is an E70. Uh, that was the generation. Um, yeah, yeah, man, they're all brown, at least everyone. I think there were some tan ones, but I think everyone I've ever seen was brown. I don't know why Toyota loves that color, but they do. Um, the car is basically screaming for a beaded seat cover. You know, when I look at this thing and I open the door, and it's this is some kind of low mileage garage queen, but and there's that Toyota buzzer. Um, look at this thing. Man, could that use one of those uh, orthopedic bead seat covers on it. Or so. You never put one on both sides. Screw your passenger. Uh, but you get one on that side, and the driver would be pretty happy. So I tell you what, look, let's just get into this damn car. We're going to go around it. And I mean, it is just sheer, pure utility. Why doesn't this open? Yeah, it did open. I right, twist that. That was interesting. It was a push button on the one we had. There you see Gandhi Toyota. Still has the original dealer sticker on it. Uh, but you know, here's the back. It's a place where you put stuff. Obviously, you could put your toddlers and your babies and your bazookas and infants and all that stuff back there. Uh, what do we have in here? That's where you keep an extra fan belt and all your jacking hardware and bags. So that's all very nice stuff. Uh, obviously, the rear seat folds forward so you get more cargo room. And I mean, you can see why these things are running all over the three. I believe in Australia, these cars are considered magical or something. Toyotas in general. Uh, I think Australia is a big, big love affair with Toyota for many years, and it probably has something to do with their proximity to Japan. But anyway, there's the uh, there's the hatch. Uh, the luggage rack looks to be in good shape. Another fine place to put your toddlers, infants, corpses, maybe even some bags or camping gear, and strap it down up there. And it's you know it's all very nice stuff. Oh, that buzzer. God, I shouldn't have left the key in the car. Let's have a look under the hood. The idle on this thing is set ridiculously high. I thought it might have a choke, but if it does, I can't find it. It's one of the few cars without prop rods where the hood just isn't that heavy. It's really, really tinny. Anyway, this is a 3TC engine. Uh, Toyota early on wanted overhead cam engines, but this is funny. They couldn't afford them. <laughs> Back in the day, so they started developing overhead valve engines. Look, it's got a Hemi head on it. Uh, overhead valve engine with the, the cam pushed up as high as it could be in the block uh, to give them almost the same effect that they were looking for. And, uh, you know, it was all like the first Corolla had like a 1.1 liter. Uh, there was some 
uh, fear at the time that that would bump it up to a higher tax bracket in Japan. You know, P.O. Oh my God, it's two. That's the big block, man. That's at one point friggin' one. <laughs> I mean, by the time this thing came out with a 1.8, it must have seemed like a 426 Hemi to the original guys who made it. But um, anyway, look, everything nice and neat under there. It's got a McPherson strut front end, which was a real problem for them in the beginning because basically they're just copying everyone else's design. They had no experience at all with McPherson strut suspensions. And apparently in the first Corollas, they all failed within like 500 miles. So they had to work on that. Um, but uh, they did and it worked out great. Uh, they also improved the rear suspension by this generation, the fourth, with a trailing arm, uh, coil springs in the back, uh, except for the wagon, which I believe did retain its leaf springs, which had gone from all the other Corollas. So uh, I guess they couldn't make the uh, trailing arm strong enough to, you know, carry the uh, stuff that a wagon would be tasked with. Uh, but anyway, you can see everything nice and proper under there. This one actually has air conditioning. The car has 75 horsepower and probably 35 with the air conditioning on. And uh, that battery, I definitely want to try and find a lighter one. But there it is. I do like those four round headlamps up front, I have to say. I do think that is a nice look. And I believe the... Uh polyurethane bumpers were new for this year. Uh, you see it's got all kinds of chrome around the windshield. This was the, you know, Toyota wanted to make a car that really ordinary people could feel proud owning. And uh, that was, uh, you know, not, yeah, obviously high quality and this, that, the other. But I mean, they wanted it to be a nice little car and they did manage that. Uh, you see the steel wheels with uh, hubcaps, center caps on them, probably missing trim rings. It looks like it should have them. And, uh, and it's just, brown. They have a little bit of a Hoffmeister kink here. <laughs> I have to hand it to them. Look at that. So taking a styling cue from BMW on this thing. Uh, back seats, you know, your Canadians, they're going to love this thing because it's so frugal. You can fit three guys back there. Uh, apparently some thought was put into these seats. Even look at the racy contrasting stripes in it. And uh, again, obviously that does fall down. Um, I, 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 this is the thing with Toyota of this vintage. They use materials that are even cheaper feeling than the stuff that GM was doing in the 80s and 90s, but they do it in such a way that it stays together and it stays actually kind of nice. Um, you know, cheap little window cranks, but they're always going to work. Uh, you know, the panels aren't pulling off and puffing up or peeling away. And, uh, of course, that is Toyota's uh, pretty epic build quality. All right, I tell you what, I need a two-second pause to, to get my crap together. Then we're going to hop inside the car and uh, go for a quick spin. There you can see the leaf springs, by the way. So, yeah, wagons did have that. Uh, front discs, rear drums, too. Anyway, uh, I'm going to take a two-second pause. We're going to hop in. We're going to take this thing for a drive. Okay, I know I promised to drive, but I realized that I had forgotten to do a very quick recap on the events of 1980, and I have not done a 1980 recently, uh, certainly not in my recent memory, so I don't want to miss that. 80 was a pretty seminal year, and uh, I want to get some of that crap out. Uh, actually, here comes Penelope now in that limousine that we bought. Yeah, we're going to get into that one later. That's going to be just offered without comment. Uh, anyway, so 1980 was a fascinating year. First of all, you had uh, Reagan was elected, but of course Carter was still in in the beginning, and he quickly authorized, uh, before uh, you know leaving office, one and a half billion in loans to bail out the Chrysler Corporation, uh, which have helped, uh, of course, helped Lee Iacocca save it. Um, there was a New Mexico State Penitentiary riot, which was a pretty big deal. Apparently, 33 inmates got killed. The Rubik's Cube came out, confounding everybody except a few assholes who could solve it really quick and risk getting shot by people like me who used to take the friggin' thing apart uh, and put it back together and pretend that I'd solved it. Uh, God, did I hate the people. You'd say, remember that shit? You'd see them on TV. It's like they, they do it with their feet or something. You just, you know, fuck you, man. You know, seriously. 
anyway, um, I really can't believe I thought about the Rubik's Cube. Mount St. Helens erupts. Uh, that was a pretty big deal at the time, and uh, I remember it making some of the news stations. Uh, John Lennon was shot and killed uh, by a guy named Mark David Chapman. Uh, unlike the guy who shot Reagan, I think Chapman is still in jail. I'm not sure if that's because Reagan lived and Lennon died, or it has to do with politics, but I don't remember any big drive to get this Chapman guy out of prison, you know, by the bleeding hearts, because I think they like John Lennon more. Uh, in Australia, you remember that whole Dingo Ate My Baby thing? Uh, that was uh, the year that that happened. Uh, the baby uh, was Azaria Chamberlain or something. Uh, disappears from a campsite at uh, Ayers Rock, which has some new name I don't remember, and uh, everybody said it was taken by a dingo, uh, or at least the mother did. Nobody believed her, and then later on, it's true, they found, like, the baby coming out the back of a dingo or something, so uh, it turned out that she had been telling the truth. Uh, it was the year for the miracle on ice. That's when the American uh, hockey team beat the Soviets. Uh, considered a pretty big deal because back then, uh, the uh, American athletes were college level. They weren't the professionals, while the Soviets were. And uh, everybody, the, the, the Soviets hadn't like lost a game since 1968. And then through some incredible miracle, the uh, the Americans did end up beating them in the semifinals and went on to beat Finland, which probably was easy. And uh, they won the uh, gold that year. Uh, of course, Ronald Reagan was elected. Uh, John Wayne Gacy, who by all accounts was probably a pretty nice guy other than all the dead bodies, uh, he got executed. Uh, Iran and Iraq start kicking the absolute shit out of each other and America supplies both of them weapons because, you know, why the hell not? Uh, CNN debuts and I guess this thing came out. That guy with Zucker, whatever the hell his name is, just got fired because he was having sex with some comely colleague of his. I think that's all horseshit, by the way. I mean, uh, I think he'd rather go out because he's, you know, having a lovely little affair than that they've lost like 90% of their viewership. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. I don't care. Uh, Post-it notes were invented, uh, which is interesting because, you know, people use scotch tape before that, which was also supplied by 3M. So I don't think it ended up being a big boon to their uh, their bottom line. They, they sold a lot of post-it notes, but they probably sold less uh, scotch tape. Uh, there was rioting in Liberty City, Miami after the uh, death of somebody at the hands of a police officer. So what's old is new again. Uh, the MGM Grand burned down in Las Vegas. That was a pretty big deal. Uh, Movie-wise, you had Airplane, which is, of course, fantastic, one of the great movies of all time. Uh, you had The Black Stallion. You had The Blues Brothers, which I probably watched 100 times. I mean, I, I hate Illinois Nazis, and, uh, you know, it's a model made before catalytic converters, so it runs good on regular gas. I, <laughs> I just had, I secretly do absolutely love that movie. Uh, Caddyshack came out, a duo to Airplane, another fantastic uh uh, movie and uh, the coal miner's daughter. I'm not sure if that's the one where Farrah Fawcett burns the guy in his bed or not, but I don't. I don't think so. I think this one has something to do with Tammy Wynette or something. Uh, then there's Dallas uh, on TV. Uh, Who shot Jr. was a big deal. The Dukes of Hazard. Magnum PI debuted. Uh, 60 Minutes was going. Mash was going. Uh, the Love Boat with uh, Captain Steubing and Gopher and all that crap. Uh, the Jeffersons, uh, Alice, uh, Three's Company, and uh, of course, a um, uh, very R-rated show where everyone was walking around in uh, garter belts and stuff, Little House on the Prairie. Uh, in music, you had KC and the Sunshine Band, you had Michael Jackson starting to do shit, you had the Captain and Tennille. Uh, you had Queen running around, you had Pink Floyd doing their thing, Blondie came out, uh, rap sort of got its commercial start, you know, with Blondie doing the world's worst rap ever uh, in that song uh, about eating Buicks or something, uh, but uh, apparently that was a seminal moment. Uh, Lips Inc. made that Funky Town song, which of course became the ultimate, you know, every skating rink wedding funeral uh, gathering. I mean, it's just a funky town just became one of those songs that you never escape. Uh, Paul McCartney was doing some shit and uh, Billy Joel and of course Christopher Cross. So uh, there is 1980 in a nutshell. And now we can get into this car and give it a drive. 
And let's just do this because I got to get on with the day. All right, so in, let me turn off this stupid buzzer. Okay, you see it's got front bucket seats divided by a center console of sorts. Uh, the seats do recline, which is nice. They're very stylish with the stripes. You've got that same nice tight uh, door panel. Uh, they did up their game on the interior this year, including the dashboard, which was a big step forward from the prior gen. They centralized most of the stuff into the uh, cluster where the driver could see it. Uh, you've also got sort of a better steering wheel or so I'm told. <clears throat> and anyway, let's get in and see what we got. All right, so you got your temp gauge, you got your fuel gauge, you got your idiot lights over there. Uh, there you see 21,000 miles on the clock of this thing. Is it true? Eh, who knows? It could be. Uh, and an 80 mile an hour speedo with 55 highlighted, which was the style at the time. Uh, there's your uh, rear defrost. Here's your AM FM. Uh, I do believe it's, uh, I don't know if it's a stereo or a radio in this. It's probably just a radio. I don't see speakers everywhere. Down here, you've got some very basic and simple climate control. Uh, you've got an ashtray because, of course, people smoked then. And uh, this one has a uh, automatic transmission, which does not mate well to that 75 horsepower engine and feels a little bit, you know, whatever. There's some filters and more keys inside the glove box, all very nice. Uh, I have no idea what this thing is, if anything. It's some sort of a blank. Why there wouldn't be a vent there, I don't know, but there isn't. There is a vent over there. Uh, you got your headlights here. You got your wiper washers there. You got a horn that probably the key has to be on for. And All right, let's just do it. And there's that ridiculous high idle that somebody needs to fix in your fasten seat belt buzzer. Yeah, no horn at all, so that fuse is probably gone. Maybe that control. It is a stereo. Look at that. We got the little green stereo. Holy shit. Oh, that's the volume. This is the tuning. It's backwards because Toyota, well, of course, it's right hand drive in Japan. Let's see. Her. Here. There we go. You really can't go wrong with the fix. Right, let's go for a spin. Oh, caught a little rubber there in Penelope's gravel driveway. She'll hate that. My friend Al did a big posy burnout in it yesterday, and she posted a picture in our group text with the phrase, giant wet shit on my head. So, <laughs> you know, Al, once again, there's a loose, look at this big, scary, terrifying dog running around without an owner, ready to rip somebody's face off. Yeah, you take it easy, man. All right. It didn't attack the car, thank God. I don't know what that was, some kind of Presario Canario or Rottweiler or something. Um, so what do I say? I mean, the car goes down the road straight. It does not have power steering. I don't think that came out until 80 one in the Corolla. I don't even think it was an option. So, uh, you know, the little old ladies who drove it had to push it pretty hard at idle. Very few of them knew that if they just got the car rolling even a little bit, the uh, steering effort would go down. It does have a nice nimble feel to it, I have to admit. The steering is pretty responsive. Uh, I mean, I could hammer it like that, and why, and who cares? I mean, there's absolutely no reason for it at all. Um, <sighs> it just doesn't make any sense. I understand that the sportier versions had 6,000 RPM red lines, and they lost basically any usable power of any kind at, at over 5,000, so it was just, just for show. But here it is, so look, I'm driving. Okay, and that's it. And that's the point of the car. You're driving. You're getting from point A to point B in a way where the car doesn't break down. And um, you're in relative comfort. You know, you don't exactly feel like you're heading towards the Ritz-Carlton or, a, you know, Gulfstream to Switzerland. But, you know, it's relatively comfortable. I'm sure, sure by third world standards, it's very comfortable. And, uh, and that's probably why this is the best-selling 
nameplate in the world. It just does precisely what it's intended to do, and that is provide solid transportation. I hear more barking going, where the hell did that come from? That is supposed to provide solid transportation to whoever buys the thing uh, without too much fuss, without too much muss. You know, it does the same job your washing machine does. Uh, and, uh, and that is apparently the whole point of the car, so. That's it. Look, I'm not going to get into it. There's going to be no highway drive because who cares? And uh, we're just going to wrap it up there. So hopefully this video is in 900 minutes. I do know I rambled on a little bit. Hopefully got a little bit of an update about where we're going and some of the fun stuff coming up. Quick list. I have a Pontiac Bonneville SSEI that's coming up. Uh, maybe a Nissan 370Z if I can find enough interesting about it to do it. Um, I have an old New York I mean, there's just, I don't know, if I can get some of this shit ready, we'll have some fun with it. Oh, and a uh, hot rod with a uh, 427 LS and a blower, but I can't make it run right now. So as soon as I do, we might probably get one on that. So anyway, look, thank you again for everything. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for subscribing, watching, and uh, commenting, and it just, again, you know, I know I say it every time, but it's true, damn it. It just keeps me going. It means a lot, and uh, I just can't thank you guys enough. So uh, take care, good luck, and we will uh, see you with the next one.